as I mentioned, you know, I, last week I sway a lot, so I tried to thought I'd try this chair. And so immediately I start swaying. And I'm so thankful for people that are wiser than I am. Lawrence immediately said, you know that chair is going to fall apart. <laughs> and it hit me. It probably was about ready to. So I'll try to avoid that as much as possible. This week, we're going to continue with 2 Corinthians. As you, as you know, last week we chased a lot of rabbits. Therefore, another rabbit that I chased is what's a group of rabbits, which is a fluffle. Um. The way Doc and I have it arranged, we're working together. I've I've done um, doing the first two weeks. Doc will do the next two weeks, and then I'll do the last class. And we have a week that we skip in the middle with Easter. Um, Really looking forward. I I always enjoy when Doc and I work together, or really, you know, teaming up with anybody. But it's such an education. Doc is so so good at assimilating uh, (laughs) concepts and thoughts. And quickly, and I can I can kind of rummage around, root around, and after 15, 20 minutes of talking and whatever, and then Doc will say one sentence and have it just and deeper. Chef used to be the I mean he was the same way, which I know it had to be he had to be very patient to put up with me because I would talk for a half hour and then he'd say the same thing in three words. Why didn't you say that first and save everybody a lot of grief? So this week, let me do a little bit of review here. And I'm, I'm going to do a little more than I normally would, but because I, I, I really want to emphasize a couple words again. Uh, hope you forgive me for taking a very different focus on 2 Corinthians, very different than I've got, ever done on a, on a letter to, uh, where I've tried to look at some themes um, and one of the themes, since we just finished 1 Corinthians uh, a couple months ago, various class, <clears throat> I wanted to look at some of the differences. I was just curious between first and second. I knew some, but, and along the way, it just kind of surprised me that there were so many themes in 1 Corinthians that are not mentioned in second. They're not just treated lightly, they're not mentioned. And uh, as you know, 1 Corinthians, there's a lot about divisions. But the, in the midst of that, there's uh, quite a long section and, and a number of mentions about uh, spiritual gifts, which are not discussed at all in Second Corinthians. Uh, what we would consider one of the longest, probably most of us would consider one of the longest passages on worship, on when we come together. Not worship in strict strict sense of how we worship God, but and when we when we look back and go, well, what did the, what did first century Christians do when they came together? And uh, uh, there's three or four chapters together that also, uh, in the midst of that, Paul's writing about the things that divide them when they come together, and this shouldn't be happening. And he discusses uh, table communion and what that what they're doing wrong, but what it means, what it's intended to be, uh, at great length. Uh, to me, uh, the, one of the strongest passages in the. In the New Testament other than in the Gospels with the Last Supper. So there's some distinct differences, and and I won't go through all of them. One of the overriding themes, if you look at most of the commentaries, is 2 Corinthians is Paul's uh, presenting a defense to his critics. There are new, what they call themselves new apostles or new leaders in Corinth who are apparently accusing Paul of not being the real deal. Um, He's not reliable. He's timid in person. Uh, he's not even willing to take payment for his ministry. And there's a, there's more things we'll touch base on. And but in dealing with that, he presents some common themes. And and in looking at these, I found some words uh, that are prevalent. Minister ministry is just one the the noun form. He talks a lot a lot about what it means to be a minister. What it, what our ministry is. His ministry is. There's a term in the beginning uh, in verse three, and I want to read this uh, as sort of our praise prayer this morning, verse three, and we will be coming back to this. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort 
with we with which we ourselves are comforted for God by God. For we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so that through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. The word comfort used a lot there, but the one that, that first caused my attention uh, was Father of Mercies. And as I discovered looking into it, that phrase is not used anywhere else in the New Testament, not with that word mercies, the, the word that's used for mercies. And uh, the word for mercies, as you might expect, is compassion, another definition, another translation, comfort. But it's a, meant to be a very deep, so, uh, even one commentary even mentioned, referenced it with splunkna, Danny's favorite word. <laughs> so, That's one. Then we've got mind. And I, w- I want to mention these two next two. Uh, I was looking into where it says, so we're not outwitted by Satan for we know his designs. And I was a little intrigued by designs and I looked up the word and it's a word that's normally translated mind. And in fact, along the way, I noticed that particular word is only used five times in the New Testament. Five looking at the wrong thing, six times in the New Testament. Five of them are in 2 Corinthians. Those things intrigue me. I don't know why, nerd, whatever, big geek. But it intrigues me when, uh, I'll back up early on, it seemed like when I first started studying, and sometimes you, you key doctrines or things that were talked a lot about, or you'd find a pamphlet, you go, these are the five things of worship, for example. And I'd go to look them up, and often I would find that whatever the issue was, there was one verse that mentioned it. Like, you give on the first day of the week. That's mentioned in one verse, and it's, in my mind, not mentioned as an all-out command. But when Carol and I first started attending church, I remember that being taught. I remember a specific class where someone asked, is it a sin if you don't do it that way? And they were answered yes, because that's a command. And so those of you who may get monthly, I'm sorry, but okay. I'm showing my bias. I don't mean I, that's, that was wrong. Okay. But I've always been intrigued by, and, and I, I'm guilty of the same thing the farther I go on, where we have concepts or, or what theologians would say doctrines, things that we come up with that we feel are core beliefs, and they may only be tied to one verse in all of Scripture. And that isn't, I'm not suggesting we throw out a verse. But it does, you, I do uh, when we run into that. But it does make me pause and back up and go, if it was really that important, wouldn't it, would it be mentioned more, one? Two, because of that, am I maybe looking at that verse wrong? Maybe there's something going on that I didn't think of. Well, conversely to that, I run into something like, this word for mind, which is noema, if I'm saying it correctly. It's almost exclusively used in one way, and it's used almost exclusively in 2 Corinthians. That's intriguing to me. You know, what is the message that God, I mean, Paul is writing, but God through Paul is giving Christians? Is there something more significant there than maybe what I thought? <clears throat> and so I'm going to, even though I did this last week, I want to read these again because I think this is important. How this is used, this word for mind, is very distinct from the other words of mind. Uh, Michelle asked me of the other words. When you, when you go to the mind of Christ, it's a completely different word. In most of the places that we read about mind, like in Philippians, it's a completely different word. It's, it's, I don't think it's a form of noema. I mean, they appear to be completely different words, and I'm not a Greek expert. But noema is almost, or is, um, I will say is, attached when, it, when it's used, it's attached to something that means not necessarily associated with evil, but not being swayed, protecting. And I'm, I'm going to read the verses real quick that it's used in. In 2.11, it says, "For we're, Don't be outwitted by Satan, for we, were, we are not ignorant of his mind, of his understand, understanding is another translation for it. Uh, 3.14, their minds were hardened. See the connection there? And chapter four, uh, the God of this world has blinded the minds. Chapter 10, take every thought captive. Take your mind, take your understanding captive for Christ. 
So it's not associated with a negative being captive for Christ, but the idea is there, we need to take it captive because the opposite may happen. I'm afraid that your thoughts will be led, your mind will be led astray in chapter 11. And even where it's not used in 2 Corinthians, the passages in Philippians 4, guard your minds in Christ. Just a, a really interesting thing. And I think, I've come to the conclusion, right or wrong, that I think this ties really well. I mean, there's meaning in this significance in where Paul, what Paul does with the rest of the letter. Then there's another word that to me kind of ties with this mind deal, even though it's very indirectly. Uh, and that is where he says, uh, I came to you in simplicity and, uh, oh, excuse me, chapter 1, 12. We behaved in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity. And simplicity is a word I know I'll butcher. It's a butcher. It's haplotes. Anyway, haplotes, yeah. But I thought simplicity was kind of unique. That's the reason I looked it up. And it literally means without pretense, without hidden motives, genuinely. And you see that word used five times in Second Corinthians, while it's the only, that's over half the times of the entire New Testament. And even though the context may not even be directly tied to a challenge of the mind or something like that, uh, in chapter 8 and 9, when he talks about giving generously or liberally, it's this word, meaning, meaning genuinely, without hidden, which is kind of cool to all, uh, I think. So I asked why these are different different ideas, why this letter is different, why these things are today. Today, we were going to focus on a couple major themes. I want to read what I just did, the first part of it. Apparently, when I sit a certain way, I'm getting static. Sorry about that. Uh, because this, I, I believe, really leads to, to two of the overarching themes of this letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction. And the two themes seem to be comfort and affliction. And that's why I think when you come back to this father of mercies, don't want to take it too far because it's only mentioned once. But when you see that where the focus of second Corinthians is, you can see maybe he put this in here for, there's a lot of significance to why he used uh, focused on father of compassion, father of mercies. I want to share a, before we get started, oh, excuse me, he also focuses on, in addition to comfort, afflictions, and we'll be talking more about that, but uh, I think we've mentioned before, this is a letter where Paul is considered the most uh, transparent is the word we use. He talks a lot about his sufferings and hardships. I think if you lined up all the places in the New Testament or in his letters where he talks about his hardships or probably be more in second Corinthians and all, all the rest combined. I don't have that nailed down, but it's, it's quite a bit. Uh, but before we get started, I want to share a video that we're very familiar with, but I want to share it for a purpose. Jen's going to start this. The, a video that we love here at Western Hills. I think we all love that video and I do and it. <clears throat> fits so well, even though Paul describes it a little different. I think that's the essence of a lot of things he's talking about. But I sh shared that in particular today because the speaker is Charles Spurgeon, who was a really prominent preacher in the late 18, mid to late 1800s. And in a later sermon, he is known to have said, well, it's from one of his sermons, the person who gave this powerful message that we just heard. I am the subject of depressions of spirit so fearful that I hope none of you ever could get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go. Thought that. <clears throat> the point, and I think Paul's point, one of his points to me, Discouragements, it's not a disrespect of persons. And part of the challenge to Paul is he's not this person, at least to the, the others are saying, that presents all this outward confidence and signs of being 
a great faithful person. And yet when we read scripture, um, we see examples like David, we see Paul, we see Elisha, we see even Jesus, not only in the gardens, a study not necessarily, not for another time, another study, is Jesus' reaction to John the Baptist's death. It's quite prolonged. You kind of have to infer some things, but I think it's, I think it's accurate that he was, Jesus was pretty shaken, pretty, probably not surprised, but I mean, uh, that the loss of his friend, good friend. And we see this in spades with Paul, as I've discussed. And we're going to get in a little bit of his, some of the things he talks about, but getting just the, what the situation is with the church at Corinth. It's almost like they're caught between two views. And one is Paul, what he's presented them, who he is and what he's presented. They've experienced life with him for 18 months. And another visit, they have letters. But then they have these new leaders. Uh, Paul even calls them false apostles. So they may claim to be apostles who are critical, not only critical of Paul, but they insist on comparing themselves to him. That's the way they approach it. Uh, he doesn't have our credentials, whatever that happened may be. And uh, if Paul were really a Christian, an apostle, wouldn't there be some sign of power? Wouldn't there be some great persuasive speech? Uh, I mentioned that I used uh, in the past a, a, a book called The Mark of a Christian by James Thompson. He has some fascinating points. It's a, it's a, even though it's an old book, it's, it's uh, as James Thompson would, some pretty interesting insight. Uh, but in 2 Corinthians 10, he points out in 2 Corinthians 10, they, they accuse him of walking according to the flesh. And he says that according to the flesh is a Greek word. And this one, I'll take his word for it just because he happens to be a world famous scholar. Is I'll say it wrong though, kata sarka or kata sarka in a worldly fashion. The reason he mentions it is this phrase in the Greek is commonly considered to be the complete opposite of kata numa, which is according to the spirit in Romans. So in essence, and this is the case he makes, they're saying if Paul really had the spirit, if he was really led by the spirit, he would be able to do this, that, and the other. I mean, as a matter of fact, if you think about it, everywhere, they, everywhere he went, they usually beat him and run him out of town half, half the time. You know, how persuasive could he have been if he was powerful? I mean, they, they, there's just lots of ways to take that. Uh, Paul's response, and as I talk about themes here, remember these are Dave's themes from what I've seen. There's a lot of other perspectives and ways to look to this, and I'm sure uh, you could uh, point out many other important. Uh, but one, he, he emphasizes God's comfort and mercy. He divulges that he's often faced time, hardship, and times of discouragement and what God has done in those times. And then he lays the foundation for what he identifies or for what truly identifies a Christian, someone who's led by the Spirit. Um, I'm going to shorten as, some of these points as much as I can. On comfort and mercy and compassion, uh, I found primarily a couple Greek words used for comfort in 2 Corinthians. Well, different, two different words. But was, what was unique to me is these are used 30 times in 2 Corinthians. I mean, that's a lot of times. Uh, one of the words is used more in Second Corinthians than all the other, all the other, all of other Paul's letters, all of Paul's other letters combined, and the other ones almost as much. So I mean, it's it just so. Again, you can come back to Father of Mercies. You can see that he expands on this over and over and over and over. God's compassion and the importance of He comforts us so that we can comfort others. Share that His compassion with others. Um, it's also one of the words is also related to this is a side note. Just take it. Uh, the masculine form for the word is only used by John. And it's Paracletos, the comforter. He doesn't always use it in, in that in referring to the comforter, the advocate, but he's the only one that uses it in his, in his letters. 
but that's not the word that's used here. It's these are other forms of it. it. We could talk a lot about that with a lot of verses, but you can you can see it as you read through. And then Paul's hardships. Um, I couldn't find a, a lot here, but the word for affliction means internal pressure or friction, pressure from within without. Uh, so it can mean without too. It's used uh, nine times, I think, in Second Corinthians. Um, and again, I know I've said it 15 times already. I know more times than all his other letters combined. Just rabbit trails. Uh, suffering is a prominent thing. And I don't know if we'll have time to get in this to me. It's a big subject that we could spend a lot of time on is he speaks of sharing in Christ's suffering. And that's another one of those topics that just, to me, kind of mind blowing to think about and, and to try to figure out what, what that really means. But he uses in share in us sharing comforting comfort and sharing sufferings. He uses, does use, as you might expect, koinonia, the partnership that we have in suffering, partnership we have in, in uh, comfort. I was going to read, I had them all printed out here, all the various things that Paul mentions, and there are a ton of them. And, and most of you have read these uh, 39 lashes, in prison, shipwrecked, all these. But I'm, to save a little time this morning, I'm going to run through just one section. And these are in multiples. If you go through and make a list, uh, probably five, six, seven chapters, he refers to these. Uh, different things he's experienced and hardships, uh, struggles he's had. Um, <clears throat> but I'm in, in 4 8, I want to re read one just to kind of emphasize the personal nature of it. This is in the section where he's talking about we have this treasure in jars of clay. I just discovered something. Okay. When you print with green highlight, don't use a red lettering. Uh, wow. But that's the section. But the part I want to read is we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying the body of Jesus, uh, body, carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. My tendency has been to read that and look at the victory part of it. You know, we're not crushed. We're not that. And maybe gloss over what Paul's speaking of what he's been through and what we might relate to. So I'm just going to read. There's four little couplets or pairs. I'm just going to read the first half. We are afflicted, which means, as I mentioned, pressed in on all sides. Perplexed. Uh, confused, which means confused. At a loss to understand. And you'll see why that's kind of significant when we come back to it. Persecuted, which is our press on. Pursued relentlessly. Well, that can be a negative. That press on can be both ways. Struck down. Yeah. So I thought about these. These are, these are not small things. These are very, and they're not just, not just things that have happened to Paul. They, they, they're kind of intimate, personal things. They kind of represent inner, inner struggle. What's that going on? I think maybe things that we can relate to each of us at various times. Uh, Tom, uh, coming back to Thompson again, he says, uh, these word descri words describe someone who is powerless against whatever is against him, him or her, who feels like they have no resources or abilities. Uh, now, when you look at it that, that light, and then you look at the second part of the couplet, Afflicted, you have pressure on all sides, but not crushed. That, to me, has a little bit more of a picture to it than afflicted. Perplexed, at a loss to understand. One of the primary meanings of, but not despairing, is to be utterly at a loss. So, at a loss to understand, confused, but not utterly, not completely at a loss. 
um, perplexed, pursued vigorously, but not forsaken. And it's the same word that Jesus uses in the garden or on the cross. Struck down, but not destroyed. One commentator, basically knocked down, but not out. So, but always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. And what does it mean? Let's just take time for any questions or comments or anybody have a thought on what it means to carry the suffering of Jesus in us? I think perhaps it's an appeal for us to be aware that it wasn't all, uh, wasn't all sweet, you know, that there was a, that God himself suffered greatly, not just on the cross, but daily from the insults and the, and the, the uh, abuse, really, that he took from the people he was trying to minister to. And uh, it seems to me that that's what Paul's doing here, reminding us that, yeah, it's not an easy road. If, if you think it's all going to be smooth and easy, you're, you're confused. It won't be. But the reward is going to be worth it. Very well put. Anyone else? Gary? You may not need the mic. Yeah. Gary? Well, I will try not to uh, eat it too badly. Uh, I, I, along that line, uh, it might be a reference to what our Lord said. Pick up your cross and follow me. It might also be a reference to you too are going to suffer just as I have suffered. I want you to share in that suffering. What Paul's doing, I think, is reminding his critics and those who are listening to his critics, I'm doing, I'm doing exactly what the Lord expected. I, I, I knew this was going to happen, and I'm making this walk anyway. Just a thought. Good stuff. Anyone else before I move on? I'm looking at you Zoom folks over there, but it's hard to see you. I didn't wear my glasses. Okay. Jen's flagging, watching. Okay. Yeah, I guess it would help if I looked at the TV up above. That's for those who's here. Really good. I, I could might as well stop here, but I probably won't. But this is, uh, <laughs> you guys wrap it up really well. That's good. Uh, I, one of the things that I have kind of wrestled with through the years, because First Peter talks a lot about this suffering and talks of equating that to the suffering of Christ, our suffering and equating. And I think it's beyond just, in quote marks, suffering for the gospel because we went out in the mission field and maybe, you know, we're threatened that in our suffering, because in other places, he says, in every affliction, in all suffering, uh, I think there's a broader context that they, it's compared to the suffering of Christ. And there's a number, number of times that Paul mentions this. And it's just it made me wonder if sometimes uh, so this, where, where is the balance between uh, living in the victory, but keeping in mind the suffering? And as a body, as a, as a family, community and how we prepare each other to live, live out the faith. Well, how does that impact us in terms of what we do together or what we need to keep in mind? Uh, one of our professors at school used to always say that every sermon needed to have a word of grace. It didn't matter what the sermon was on because somebody there might be on their last legs. Somebody might be in the depths of despair, like Paul's describing or like, We've experienced probably everyone in this room at one point. And we also, we always need, because that's where God's at. And that's a big part of this letter. I'm, I've skipped a little bit. So on the, I'm going to jump into this and try to do it relatively fast. Apologies. But so what identifies a Christian? Just to, we've got more lessons, but I'm going to throw out kind of the conclusion of this, these two classes. To me, uh, Paul basically says, my words, these folks are missing the point, these other leaders, the false leaders. Uh, 
in verse in chapter five, he says they take pride in the outward appearances versus the heart. And so I'm going to read just real quick some passage, just quick verses in uh, chapters one through five. And I hate to take these out of context, but we just don't have time unless we spend another 10 weeks. So uh, keep in mind as you go through this, how many times Paul talks about his ministry or strength is not from his abilities, as, and the implication is, as the world would look to, as these other leaders, but from God through the Spirit, uh, relying on God versus his abilities. How many times he talks about things, standards, that the world would hold up, or perhaps these other leaders, uh, or he references these versus what reality is in the fa- in, as a Christian in faith. So chapter, take you through the ride here real quick. You may want to just listen because I'm going to be jumping. So in chapter one and verse eight, he just says, so we were utterly bur- burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life to itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the center of death. Uh, here's why I get in trouble. I've got some of the red in here that I mentioned. That was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Uh, another verse for our boast is this: this that the testimony of our and the testimony of our conscience that we behaved in the world with simplicity, without duplicity, genuinely and godly sincerity not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God. He comes back both ways, not by the world standards, but by God's grace. And verse 21, and it is God who establishes establishes us with you in Christ. He's the one who's anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and has given his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. at the end of chapter two, for we are not like so many peddlers of the word of God's, of, of God's word, but as men of sincerity commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Uh, we're not so as like so many who are peddlers of the world of word, of word of God. That's a pretty good hit, but he's referring to those who seek gain or doing things for gain. Gain doesn't have to be money. as we, the example we had last week. It could be prestige, power. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you? Who needs letters of recommendation? Well, that's kind of a worldly thing, isn't it? Uh, But you are our letters, he goes on. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything that's coming from us. But our sufficiency is from God who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter of the Spirit. And there's a whole wonderful section on the new covenant, which we're not going to have time. Doc may want to, but I don't have time. Uh, Therefore, this is chapter four, having this ministry on the mercy of God, here's mercy again, we do not lose heart. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So we do not lose heart, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look to things that, as we look not to things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are not unseen are eternal. Notice that just continual reference to what's outwardly seen. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to, may able to, be, may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearances and not about what is, what is in the heart. Just a few passages that are there. Reliance on Christ. And our standards are different. And that's where I come back to these words of Noema, the mind, guarding your mind. Because we are, how many times we talk about, we're just continually hit by the world in what 
and comparing ourselves to others and what's out there. And if we um, may have a little time for comment on this, it's easy for us in the church to point out to the world and say, see how wrong that is. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty guilty a lot of falling into this trap. That's a whole separate discussion. We may use different standards in the church. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I couldn't get up front. Well, I don't take the time for this. I get distracted into so many things. That, you know, what good am I to the church? I'm not on the go like this other person that goes 90 miles an hour. Always there. Uh, we can come up with all kinds of standards. And I think these passages apply, uh, really apply to us. Um, and that idea of apotes, the idea of sincerity, genuineness. You know, again, protecting our minds to not fall into a trap of putting on an image that's not, not real. Um, so the last question is, oh, one more comment I want to make you. Notice this idea of being led by the Spirit. Uh, and thinking about what, and they, they kind of basically accuse him of not being led to the, by the Spirit. What is the Spirit known by? And Danny's working on Galatians 5 on fruit, love, joy, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, you know, all these things that I think everybody appreciates. I won't say the world doesn't appreciate that. But that's not what's held up as, quote, success or a sign of somebody who's got it together necessarily. Except maybe in those rare cases of Mother Teresa where everybody celebrates a life of service. Um, and Paul alludes this to this. And he does, well, he, he alludes to, he speaks of the spirit a lot. But in chapter six, he uses some of the same, same words, kindness, gentleness, when he's referring to to the actions that count. So last question, any questions or comments on that? Okay, I'm looking forward to next week. Doc's got some really great thoughts uh, we've discussed. And I think you'll be looking forward to that. We are going to be gone next week, so I'm going to have to listen to the tape. So I'm not leaving out of existence. <laughs> We're going to see our son in Virginia. So. Thank you so much. So for random thoughts.